Welcome. I'd like to welcome you to the Maytech Network's webinar, Online Learning Strategies Theory Overview. This webinar is brought to you by Maytech Networks. Networks is a part of Maytech, a member of workforce development at the Maricopa Community Colleges, and sponsored in part by the National Science Foundation. Now what I would like to do is turn it over to our moderator, Mike Lezecki. Mike, welcome, and the webinar is yours. Thanks, you, Tracy. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure today to welcome our two presenters. Now let me tell you a little bit about them. First, Diane. Diane McKee. She has an extensive background in K-12 STEM education and a lot of experience in teacher professional development, program development, and management. And Diane tells me that she's taught both hybrid and pure online courses. You know, prior to joining the Maricopa Community Colleges as project coordinator for the ST4 STEM project, that's a NSF funded project, she spent over 11 years at the Arizona Science Center. Diane holds her bachelor's degree in physical geography and a master's in science education, both from Arizona State University right here in Tempe. Welcome, Diane. Why don't you say hi to the audience this morning? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Good. You sound good, Diane. Now, let me, uh, hey. folks, <laughs> folks, let me introduce Jeanette. Jeanette. Dr. Jeanette Schaefer serves as the instructional technologist for the Maricopa Center for Learning and Instruction right here at the Maricopa County Community Colleges. She has over 10 years of experience designing and teaching online courses for the online academy with George Mason University. Jeanette holds her bachelor's in art education, a master's in computer education, and a PhD in education with a major in instructional technology. She also has a minor in instructional uh, design as well. So as you see, we have two very uh, experienced presenters. Jeanette, would you say hello to everybody online? Yes, hello everyone. It's an honor to be here with you. Great. Thank you, Jeanette. Folks, let me take you to the next slide, which is the objectives for today. So let's review these briefly. Number one, we want to present an overview of a couple of these major theories uh, that people talk about in online education, things like constructivism and experiential and contextual learning theories. So once we do that, we want to talk about what learning principles work for deeper learning and that all-important student engagement. Let's give you some examples of the third bullet of online instructional strategies that have worked, that have been successful. And then we're going to challenge you with eight goals going forward, eight things that you want to accomplish. This is like your action agenda uh, for developing a student-centered online course. Now we've had the opportunity to introduce our presenters. Let me ask you now, participants, so question about yourselves. So this is an audience poll. As Tracy mentioned, I'd like you to use the re poll responding button. It's right near the top of the participants list. You can go ahead and start responding. And you'll see an A, B, C, or D there. So how many of you have taught or facilitated an online course? That's A. How many have taken an online course? That's B. C, designed an online course, or D, other? Now, there's going to be some overlap, but just give me your best shot at the answers here. This isn't a hard question, so just go ahead and, and fill out what you've done. I see a lot of people have responded. Let me give you uh, just another five seconds to make up your minds, A, B, C, or D. I'm going to count <laughs> down. Five, four, three, two, one. Go ahead and Tracy. Let's go ahead and close the poll, and let's see what people have said. Well, look at that, uh, Jeanette and Diane. We've got uh, quite a mixture here. Lots of folks have taught, taken, and uh, designed an online course. So a whole spectrum of people uh, in our group today. So that's exciting. Yes, I'm gonna that's now, nice uh, That's excellent. Good. Uh, Diane and um, Jeanette, I'm going to turn over to you. Why don't you go ahead and advance the slide to show us your Wordle? OK. <laughs> There you go. So, it's, it's um, we kind of did this. All right, thank you. So here's your overview, and we're kind of doing this as, t as a tongue-in-cheek um, uh, slide, but basically it does point out some of the real key uh, points in effective online learning. So we thought that would be kind of fun to show you real briefly. So I'm going to let Jeanette take it away and get us started. 
So, Jeanette? Okay, so we realize we only have an hour here, so we can't go into every learning theory out there. Um, we can't go into a lot of detail, so we want to do a brief overview of some of the major theories that are being used um, in the classroom and how they're working online based on our experience. So the first one is behaviorism, and online learning really started with, behavior, with a behaviorism model theory behind it. And what this means, it's just um, it's the more traditional model of instruction that everyone's used to in the classroom. So it was an easy transition into online learning. Um, and for the online learning, what that means is there's explicit instructions and outcomes for students. They know exactly what the expectations are. They know what the outcomes are going to be. And they're actually able to measure, um, they can judge for themselves how they're doing. So, and this is also uh, done through testing and grading. On top of that, content is sequenced appropriately to the course and the course content, making it easy for students to begin and transition to uh, the outcomes at the end of the course. Now, what has worked for us, one thing that we've implemented with our online um, courses is actually using some gamer points and achievements and awards. So, as they progress through content, they can actually judge where they're at in the process based on their game of points and what awards they've received. So that's just one. We'll share more, but that's just one to get you started. Um, and then we've found this quote that um, kind of says it all, and it ta it's talking about how online learning started out as behaviorism, and the technology is helping us to advance it more to a constructivism model. So that's just a little quote to share with you. Okay, Diane. All right. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about cognitivism, and I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with this. But the way that we look at this is it's a way of organizing information um, in meaningful ways. So in this theory, it's really about getting that knowledge into memory for your students. So there's a variety of ways that we can do that. Um, we look at accommodating different learning styles by offering different modes of learning, um, especially chunking content. Everyone, as we know, learns better when they're digesting small bits of, of information. Um, the content is sequenced from simple to complex, so we're scaffolding and building a foundation for students as they progress through your course. Um, and again, really it's about getting that knowledge into memory. Um, you want to provide a lot of support and provide opportunities for reflection for students. You want to try to ground their uh, learning in real life applications. And a lot of the uh, points of cognitivism really speak to course design. How it's laid out, how the material is presented, this all makes a big difference on how students learn. And what really worked for us, there's a number of these items that worked well, but I think one of the most successful pieces uh, is chunking. So for example, we have, say there's eight, eight assignments in a module. Some of the assignments might take five minutes. Some may take ten. Some may take an hour. Oh, so that's why you put in that pumpkin chunk in there. Oh, I know. I, I had to do it. We're being silly, but we're also trying to uh, keep everybody interested. Um, one of my favorite shows every Halloween time. Um, but anyway, so a lot of these uh, pieces really work well, but the, the chunking for us has seemed to be very, very successful. And I'm going to let Jeanette move us forward with uh, a conversation on experiential. All right, so experiential learning. Um, Diane, is this, do, do some faculty find this hard to implement? I think absolutely. I think when you're talking about um, giving an assignment where the student has to actually conduct an activity, hands-on, an experiment, uh, anything like that, it's a lot harder to assess for some instructors. Um, it's a little more work and effort. So okay. I think it's a little more challenging, but it's beneficial. Yes, I agree. Um, and for some reason, I find this a natural fit for me. I've always done experiential learning, even in my 10 years of teaching online. Um, this has always been an important piece of course design, course content, mm -hmm. and student activity. So what the experiential learning is, is you're supporting learning by doing, and then they reflect on um, what they've learned. So just um, some examples. It's a concrete activity. It's something that they can take back and actually do hands-on. And then they have the opportunity to actually reflect on their learning. 
Um, and then they analyze that. They actually look at it and see what made a difference, what worked, what didn't work, what do I need to change. And then they can actually apply that new knowledge in different uh, learning situations or different situations. And there's an emphasis on the learning and not so much the product. So this is where students can fail, reflect, analyze, and then try it again. So um, it's always worked well for me in my online courses, and I've designed the courses that way because I don't know. It's, it's just it's good teaching practice. Yeah, yeah, it's worked really well. Yep. Um, we have another quote here in um, what worked for us: hybrid approach to pedagogy that combines online learning with experiential offline hands-on learning, and that really sums up what has worked with us in our current courses and what has worked in um, recent courses, past courses. So. We want to poll you and see how many of you have um, kind of played around with experiential learning with your online courses. Mike, you want to take, yes, it, you take it away? Yes, thanks. So audience, uh, remember, please respond to this poll now. I see many of you are already doing that. Use the polling button right at the top of the participants list. So how many of you have used experiential learning in your online course? Of course, you have to be teaching an online course to answer this, but is it yes, no? No, but sounds good. I'm excited to try. So I'm going to go ahead and, and put in my entry here. Just a moment. Got to find my name. Okay, uh, Tracy. Let's go ahead and give them uh, a countdown for uh, for five, five, four, three, two, one. Go ahead and close the poll and let's see what people's experience here. Well, look at that, uh, Diane and Jeanette. Quite a quite a bit of experience here. That's really exciting. Yeah. And it looks like it's about half and half. So um, a large percentage, percentage are trying it and using it. And then um, others are kind of curious, not really using it, but interested in trying. Yeah. This is this Go ahead exciting. and take us forward. Very good. OK. So let's talk a little bit about constructivism. This is my personal favorite. Um, and constructivism basically is about um, allowing students to build and acquire their own knowledge. Um, it's a student-centered approach. Um, it's, but Jeanette and I really found out through all of our uh, online experiences that the instructor becomes facilitator. And I think that's vitally important to remember as, as you go through an online course. It's really is about facilitating learning and not teaching directly to them. Um, it's, constructivism is very social, um, collaborating, brainstorming, um, looking at case studies. It's an active um, an active theory. So again, you're looking at problem-based learning and again, collaborating and brainstorming all fit into that. It's in context. Um, it's hopefully very engaging. And you want to provide options for your students for that individual learning. And we have done a lot of that in well, the last couple of years with our, with our classes. Yeah. We build right in opportunities for students to decide, um, within reason of course, you've got competencies to think about, um, what it is that they would like to do. And we design for that. And we also design for interaction. Now, Diane, do you find it kind of hard um, if you have students that are not used to learning with a constructivist style, do you find it's kind of hard to get them going at first? It's very difficult. Um, I think our students are very accustomed to being told exactly what to do and, and typically in what order to do it. So I think that you have to be very flexible and be very willing to mentor students and help them learn how to do projects on their own or take, take control of their own learning, basically. So do they typically come around, you know, partway through the course? I think or most do, do you lose them? Do they drop the course? I think or? most do. As we know, online learning is not for everyone. There are uh, inherent challenges to online learning. You have to be very self-motivated. So, you know, it's it's not for everyone. But I find that if you provide that additional assistance, um, the retention rate is much greater. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so what we'd like to know here is um, a little bit of information about what you're using in your online courses, and Mike will take it from here. Thanks, folks. So here's the next poll. Which learning theory do you use most when teaching online? And you can see your choices there, A through E. I bet you, I'm guessing now, Diane and, and uh, Jeanette, that there will be a combination here, but we'll have to see how the polling shakes out. So go ahead, folks, and, and make your best shot, A, behaviorism all the way down to the combination of E. Make your choices A, B, C, 
D or E. Use the box right up in the participant uh, area. Okay, so we're, we're almost done. They're getting fast with these polls. Let me give them a countdown, Tracy. Yeah, uh, yes, Tracy, they five, are. four, three, two, one. Uh, go ahead and close the polls. Oh, look, I was right. How exciting. <laughs> uh, most people in the combination wow. mode here. Excellent, excellent. Absolutely, that's great. That's great to see. I love seeing the wide um, range of experience, what everyone's using. That's great. Right. All right, folks. It's. Okay. Are you, do you want to pause there for a moment for questions, or do you want to keep going? Okay, good. Oh yes, yes, uh, yes. Yes. Everyone online, I want to remind you that you can um, make comments or put questions into the chat box, and uh, and and we'll have opportunities throughout this webinar to address them. Let me bring the first question forward, uh, Diane and, and Jeanette. Do you recommend scheduling formal opportunities for reflection in your online courses? Do you do that, Diane? Absolutely. Um, we build it into the course and we provide several opportunities to do um, reflection. Um, the most uh, common way we do it is we post questions or assign uh, readings and then have students go into something like uh, Google Plus Community or we'll set up a poplet. And by the way, you'll get links to uh, these resources that we're using um, later. Um, and we have them post so that their peers can see what they've gained or learned or reflected upon and then also make comments uh, for each other. And then also we build in kind of a self-reflection at the end of each module. So you know, what, what is your, t your big takeaway? How do you feel about this? How does this impact your life? So there are several opportunities that good. are built that in. That sounds like a good strategy. Now here's an interesting question. I actually was thinking about, uh, about this myself too. I have to admit, I'm not all that up to date on cognitivism. Could you give us the elevator speech? Give us a, a, a top level um, reminder of what that is again. Okay. Yeah. Do you have anyone? To, okay. So basically, cognitivism um, is all about organizing information in meaningful ways so that your students have the opportunity to acquire knowledge. And that's the basic premise. And also, the research is showing that um, for opportun well, for best learning, you don't want more than about nine items on your um, home page of a module. You want to keep it more condensed. Um, so it's really about accommodating various, various learning styles, uh, such as chunking and chunking content, uh, multimedia, so you want a variety of, of learning methods. Um, you want to provide support and reflection, but really it's about that knowledge acquisition. And with online learning, a lot of this can be accomplished through course design. So you really you know, kind of study up and pay attention to course design. You can accomplish a lot of the goals um, to, to help with that. Follow-up question on that. So would you say that cognitivism deals with mental schema? That's the question in the chat box. Not sure. I think it, Do you it, understand it, the I question? It, it could. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I think so. Um, I think that it, it speaks to um, how people learn, um, probably most importantly. Uh, and so by using this particular theory, you have ways of addressing how different people learn or need to learn. So I think it's, it's a good uh, theory for that. Very good. I've got another approach, uh, excuse me, another question. Uh, would you and do you access students' learning styles? I mean, do you do something to figure out their learning styles before you use any of these approaches, in, in particular constructivism? Would you, you know, figure out your students' place, I guess, or where they're at before you start doing these things? Um, the, the one thing that we do, we, all, we look at the audience first. So we try to gauge um, who we're working with before we even start the course. Um, but we, when we design, we also try to design for as many different learning styles as possible you know, within reason. So we, we do do that. But then the other thing, Diane was going to talk a little bit about it later, but um, she's got to, I don't want to give away everything. <laughs> but the one thing is, is, as soon as we get into the course, we listen to our students and we start making adjustments right away. And we've done that with every course we've ever done. So we're constantly trying 
Like I said, I don't want to give away all I know. I don't want to give away all of our content. It's coming up soon. Okay, good. Just say okay. that we consider our course a living document and that it is constantly under revision based upon feedback and results. All right, cool. Yeah. You know what? In the interest of time, <laughs> thanks. In the interest of time, I'm going to save any uh, further questions for another question, Big. I'm going to click uh, to the next slide and we're going to start hearing more about these theories in action. So go ahead. Okay, so here we're going to talk about a couple projects that we've worked on um, through the years and how that's contributed to our ideas and our assumptions. So the one project I started working on early on, it was an online academy which was entirely built around constructivism. And there was not a teacher role per se, instead the teacher was a mentor. And what I gathered from this, there are really good pieces to take from that, but overall it's not a good model if you have to teach a lot of students, if you have large classes. So there are certain components to pull from it that work very well in larger classes, but the actual mentor role, you need to have a small number of the students. So I guess if it would be a specialized class where you know, you're going to have less than 10 students, maybe it would be great, but um, more than that, it becomes hard to manage that particular model. So we'll share um, some of the components later that work that can be implemented into larger classes. Another um, project was a, a North Tier Consortium, and this was active learning where the participants, the students, learn new skills. They practiced those skills. They did an experiential activity where they actually did a hands-on implement it. They did reflection and they got peer feedback. Um, that's been really successful because that you can do with larger numbers. And you know, once you get the model down and the process down, students catch on really fast and they're able to move through because it's a familiar format in each module or each unit of the course. So that's been really successful. And then Diane, um, we've recently been doing a CTE 230, a career and technical education course for um, instructional technology. So share a, little, share a little bit about that. This has been a really fascinating experience. Um, and it reflects earlier experiences that I've had with online classes and hybrid classes and distance learning classes. But what we found is we went a little too far into the learner-centered world. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> so what we found happening is that students felt um, a little lost. They were uh, a bit uncertain of, about where they were going and how long it was going to take and when things were due and, and, and what they just needed to accomplish to be successful. So we've been making adjustments. We, you know, we talked a few minutes ago about um, an online course to us being a living document. Um, we have made three major changes over the last two years. And they involve quite a few things, but what we found ourselves doing is pulling back and having being a little more along the cognitivism line with a little more uh, thoughtfulness in the, in the course de uh, design and layout. Um, so we went actually went to a little more structure so that we found that the students responded when it was a more familiar structure. We had started them off in a kind of a gaming learning management system which was new and transferred them very quickly into a Canvas um, learning management system. And so this course that we just finished this spring was by far the most successful with the most completers because we took feedback as we went along and we made these changes so that um, they were able to recognize the expectations and where they were going and what they had to accomplish. So that's been a really interesting um, kind of evolution of this particular course. And we're very happy mm -hmm. with, with where we're at with that. And a great learning experience for all, us including the students. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we listened very, very closely to their uh, comments and, and their struggles and responded. So it's worked out very nicely. So we are going to, um, in the next slide, present you with something that is of our own making, and you can take from it what works for you. But this, this is, and we're going to do a drum roll for you, the first and daily is our theory of all. Now again, this is Diane and Jeanette's theory of all, <laughs> and uh, you know, gleaned from our experiences with teaching online courses. And I would like to take a quick moment and explain our rubber band ball because what we've decided and the reason we, we came up with this theory of all is that we found that between the two of us with our experiences that 
we're taking best practices from all these different theories. And I think probably that's what you all are doing as well. So the rubber band ball kind of shows that integration of all of these ideas and best practices. So Jeanette? Okay, so looking at this, um, by the way, we, we, use, we use Poplet, Poplet to create this whole graphic. Um, Poplet.com, it is a very useful teaching tool. So it's something you may want to check out. And information um, will be on the handout, the, the link for it. So you'll be able to look it up. But we created just a little graph to, to visually display the pieces that we're pulling in. And we're going to go into detail on each one, but just a little overview. You've got the student interaction, the reflection, expectations, learner choice, course design, game base, building community, and contextual. And you may kind of see a theme running through here. So we pulled a quote, and online learning requires a new pedagogy that is built on establishing a relationship between the instructor or, uh, or facilitator and the learners. We strongly believe in our experience it all comes down to relationships. So you want to provide the opportunities for the students to connect with one another and to connect to you as a facilitator or, or instructor. So um, I just recently read a book too and it said business has always been about relationships and it will always be about relationships. So yep. we're in the business of education. It's all about relationships. So that's what we've gained from our experience also. Don't mm -hmm. you think Absolutely. that you know, students stay in the course because they've connected with you. They drop the course because they feel like they're all alone right. in a course. And I, you know, I know that there was a, a nice mix of folks who have taken or taught um, online courses. But I personally have taken them and have found that there were some classes where I never heard anything back from my instructor and others where there was constant communication. And of course I enjoyed that class much more and got more out of it. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to look at in detail, we're going to talk about each of the components of our learning of all, um, and what's been successful for us. Again, we're all in different situations with different, uh, you know, groups of students, um, but we wanted to really give you some more examples of how these have worked for us. Um, so we're going to go through these principles or strategies that make up our theory of all. So I'm going to let Jeanette kick us off with building community. All right, so building community, this can be taken to many different levels. It may be a small sense of building community, or you may go all out to where building community is a very, very important component. Part of that's going to be based on how, what you're comfortable with as an instructor, and then the other will be based on your students. But some of the things that we've done to try and encourage that sense of community, uh, putting in reflective practices. I know. You can go reflect the practices, you can go both ways, where it's more personal or it's more, uh, more where you're trying to build a sense of community and getting feedback from others. We do a little bit of both, but some of the reflection on experiential activities are real successful when they're shared with peers because they start getting peer feedback and that strengthens and starts um, conversations that wouldn't otherwise take place. We also use collaborative tools, any type of collaborative tool. Sometimes it's within the learning management system. Other times they're separate tools. Um, one of our favorites right now is Google Plus. Um, we, use, we set up Google Plus communities so that when they do the reflective practices, they'll share in that environment. They can ask questions. Um, I know there are similar tools within learning management systems too. So once again, you'll have to do what works best for your environment and your students. Then, the other piece that's, um, I think this is vital, and some instructors miss the boat on it, but you really, really need to follow the discussions. If you do discussion boards, that's a popular way for conversation to grade students in an online environment. The instructor needs to be actively engaged with that. And if, there's, if the conversation isn't flowing, spend the first week or two really getting in there providing prompts to encourage conversation. I'll even refer to certain students or say, hey, what, what do the rest of you think? Or why don't, um, Susan, why don't you give us some feedback? So you really have to go out of your way to do that. The other thing that works really well, which is kind of fun if it fits your personality, is to create a fake student in the class. And we use the fake student to maybe, you know, get students a little rowdy or to, you know, to kind of, pull students out to start a conversation because they strongly disagree 
with your fake student or, you know, maybe the fake student's being kind of fun and goofy and that gets them to loosen up and actually join in the conversation. That has worked well too, but once again, it doesn't always work in all environments, so you have to figure out um, if, if that's appropriate or not. And then the final thing is a good old fashioned meetup, and a meetup is where we all come together face to face. I, when I do it, it's a typically hand on kind of experiential activity or just a hands on um, where we're applying the skills that we have learned. And I tend to do them about the third week. I, the courses I've done are typically about eight weeks, and I do it about week number three. So that brings in to where we can apply some of the skills that they have learned so far. It's actually excellent for those students that might have been struggling because it brings them in, it gets them connected to other students, it allows them to meet me as the instructor and to ask to be comfortable asking for help. Um, it also helps after the meetup because as they continue in the course, hopefully they've established relationship with other peers and they're more comfortable asking them for help or at least collaborating on assignments. Yep. All right, so Diane's going to, no, actually we're going to do another little poll and we want to find out what your feedback policy is at your institution. Thanks, uh, folks. So you know, this is an interesting question because I was thinking about this, Jeanette and Diane. A lot of the things that you're suggesting, they do take time, don't they? And uh, how, how yes. much time yeah. are we allowed by our institution and on, on the, under the <laughs> pressures that we're under? So there might be some, you know, uh, questions about this as we go forward. But folks, what is your policy now? Please answer A, B, C, or something else for uh, D uh, under E. Do you have to provide feedback to a student inquiry within six hours? 12, 24, or 48, or something else. What do you think? Use the polling buttons up there in the box at the very top of the participants list. Um, I, I bet you there's quite a variety across the country here. You know, I was looking at our, our list while people are answering, Diane and, and uh, Jeanette. There's people from 27 different states that have registered for this webinar. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and, I, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and, I, awesome. and I bet you uh, there is a variation. Okay, everyone, you know what your policy or don't know it, put in your answer. Tracy, let's count down five, four, three, two, one. Let's take a look at, close the poll, let's take a look. Oh, look oh, at wow. that. Uh, okay. Not many. I was watching the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching yeah. the chat window a little bit, and I think a lot of those others are people that um, they don't have policies yet. That could be true. There's no policy in place, yeah. right? So that's that's interesting. What is it here at Maricopa? Wow. Okay, so what is our policy? Yeah, Diane, you want to give them a little input on our opinion, right? Um, I think it varies uh, in our districts. For those of you who don't know, uh, Maricopa has ten campuses throughout the valley, and um, I've noticed a difference from campus to campus on on um, response time. I've had instructors who tell you up front that it's 48 hours. I've had other instructors who haven't said anything and it's been a week. So we have found, and, and this is something that I think is one of the most important things you can do is to have a quick response time. Um, it makes a huge difference. Um, and the staff push that time. So we tell our students, we're going to get back to you within 12 hours. And I'm serious, <laughs> that's weekends and that's weekdays. So, you know, when I'm teaching CTE 230, I will check my email twice a day on Saturday and Sunday. And that's one of the changes that I mentioned when we, when we have been um, evolving the CTE 230 course over the last two years. That's one of the more significant changes that we made. And I spend plenty of time in that Google Plus community. And even if it's a, hey, great job, it, you're in there. You're visible. You're reachable. So I spend a lot of time in the community. Um, I am typically back to students with a response via email in just a matter of a couple hours, typically. Um, and then what we also do, and I know Jeanette does this as well, we have different ways of communicating. And I know that, that time is precious for everyone, but we've found it's made a, a big difference in um, completion, is that we will email, we will do what we call coffee breaks, which are little video little tiny video messages that we put into the module. Uh, Jeanette likes her uh, gentle remind reminders and soft mm -hmm. nudges. So, you know, yes, these are adults. Yes, they should be responsible for their own learning. 
but we still find it's really effective to remind them when big assignments are due or just to say, hello, how's it going? Do you need any help? And how often do you do the coffee breaks? Um, you know, anywhere from once a week to four times during the semester. It just depends on, on the class again and how participatory they are and what kind of, of uh, feedback you're seeing in the community right, right. and, you know, are the assignments getting done? <laughs> I know with the uh, general reminders, I typically do those once a week, and I try to time it to where it's midweek into the course, because I've taken courses myself and online out of mine, so it's nice yeah. to get that reminder, yeah. hey, don't forget you're enrolled in this course, and the assignments are due by this date. So I've always used general reminders and send them once a week. But okay, I think now we're going to take a look at the coffee break. Yes, we are. Example. I'm going to move us to that now, so it'll it'll launch individually <laughs> on your machine, and when it gets done running, we're going to take you back. So just a moment. You you may have to press play depending on your particular machine. Great suggestion, Mike. Here we go. Go ahead and take us back, Tracy. Very good. Diane, that was you. That was me. <laughs> that was me. And that was just a just a touching base. Hi, how are you? What do you need? And sometimes 47 those are very seconds effective. I noticed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're getting into learner choice. Um, like Diane said, when we first did Oh, we need to go back. No, I'm sorry. We'll oh, come back. yeah. Okay, we'll back to it. Um, so with learner choice, like Diane said, with the CTE 230 course, we got a little carried away with providing too much student-centered um, learner choice. So we had to take a step back, make it a little bit more structured. And the one thing we did with the gaming environment was that we did quest-based gaming. And by using quest-based gaming, basically the quest base allows you to break to chunk your content and kind of break it down into little mini modules or just just chunk the content. We were able to put in optional learning activities. Now you're probably thinking the average student, okay, it's optional work, not doing it. But in our case, there were just students that got excited about some of the tools or some of the concepts, and they did. They actually did the um, extra learning activities. The other thing you can do with quest-based learning, you can put in roles so they can actually learn the content and play it through a different role. So they have an option of how they want to experience the content. And you could even do that with learning styles. If you just want to chunk it by learning styles, then they could pick the option that applies to their learning style so they don't have to complete all three options. They just pick the one that's of most interest. So that's something to consider. Uh, the other thing we started out with and we still do a little bit of is providing the, the option of sequence for learning activities. Some learning activities learners may view as easier to do, where others may be more complex. So, and it may just come down to the mood. What are they in the mood? Are they in the mood to write that essay you want them to write, or are they more in the mood to play around with the multimedia tool and, and create a product? So you can give them option in the sequence of their learning activities. Once again, you've got to look at your learners, and you have to look at your content and what you're comfortable with. But those are things you can consider when providing learner choice. We've also had success with teaming up for assignments. Um, once again, this doesn't work in every course, so you have to judge for yourself. But the learner select their own, they, they form their own teams. And this comes through established relationships and even people they knew before they came into the course. So consider providing that as an option at some point if you're able. It's not, I would not say do it with every single assignment or every single activity. But there's a time and place. 
And then a big one is learner choice of instructional materials. This comes back to learning styles. If you can provide a document for someone to read, but then also provide maybe a YouTube video where it's the same content and they can pick, then that's good. All right, are we okay? Yes, yes we're I'm fine. I'm not we're sure fine. what that was. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, excellent. And also, Jeanette, don't you haven't you used that for turning in assignments? Not just a way of learning, but also as a way of turning in assignments, giving them free choice on how they're going to do that. Yes. Um, you mean as far as how did we get how they do the assignment? Right. Or how? Yes. So if you have a person that's more multimedia, then they um, yes they can turn in their product as a multimedia product, right. where someone else may want to turn in just a worksheet or an actual essay. So, saying, so, so it's learning and turning in assignments yes, and yes, doing assignments. Yes. Right. Yes. The way they show, the way they demonstrate their learning. Right. Excellent. So um, let me address the rabbit first, because I know it seems very random. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, some of our we're talking about contextual learning, and some of our students in the past have been a part of an agricultural program. And um, I actually went out to one of the schools one day, and they showed me their rabbits. So I just thought it was kind of fun. We did one thing in a blank space, and it just kind of talks about putting it in context. So basically, you know, contextual learning is really about concrete learning and applying knowledge, but it's also about Building upon existing student knowledge and their personal interests. Uh, that is hugely important. And you want, of course, to encourage again that experiential learning in that context. And what we found is that, uh, of course, we have course competencies like you do for our CTE 230 courses. So we can identify issues within those, those um, competencies that give a little freedom for students to work within personal areas of interest or areas that they're already knowledge knowledgeable about. So how do you find out about personal interest? In an online and learning environment, we're not in the classroom holding the conversation. No, so, so there's a couple ways actually. So when you're very active in your community, <laughs> you learn a lot about your students. So we kind of, I'm not going to say we spy, but we kind of read through all the postings. And, and sometimes you get a sense of what people are interested in and what they're doing. Um, I've had telephone conversations with students when they're like, I don't know how to do this project, and so we can work through, you know, what are you interested in, what do you like to do, how does this fit within the parameters of the assignment, and work with them personally. And I know that's asking a lot, but we have done that on many occasions. You can mentor them on email or in that uh, course community, um, and again, drawing hints uh, from uh, the community postings. And then, haven't you done old-fashioned telephone conversations? I have. <laughs> yes, <laughs> on a regular basis. I think I think that in this digital age, uh, many of us have gotten away from the telephone, and especially online. You know, we don't have office physical office hours. Um, at least Jeanette and I don't. So we have virtual office hours. So we basically tell them <laughs> seven to four, call us. Right. So we're probably a little more accessible um, than some of you uh, are. But again, that's a, it's a really great old-fashioned tool that makes a big difference in helping a student get to class. And in my experience, that telephone call has made a difference between a student dropping and a student staying in the yep. course. Yep. So, so it's definitely worth it to pick the phone up occasionally and right. make that phone call. Right. And I know I've seen several people um, have been joining uh, over the last 10 or 15 minutes, and I just wanted to remind you that we are talking about, <laughs> again, Jeanette and Diane's theory of all, um, based upon our personal experiences of pulling what we consider best practices from uh, the various learning theories. So expectations. Um, this is another really important piece, and I'm sure you all agree that it's very difficult for a student to uh, get through a course without understanding explicitly what they are supposed to do and how they are supposed to do it. So in, our, uh, in the class CTE 230 that we've been talking about, um, our expectations are laid out very clearly and in numerous locations. So in the syllabus, uh, on the home page of the, of the Canvas course, um, and it's explicit in the sense that if they look at their syllabus, it'll tell them when things are due. And, and I, 
this may seem a little bit like hand holding, but again, it's kind of where we are at with helping students complete. If you look at the syllabus, it will tell them when they should begin to work on a project. And then again, when that project is due. So we really try to make that very visible to them. We also give them examples of quality work, what that looks like. We don't give them a rubric per se, but if we're asking them to post in Google Plus community, we will put in a, a full point sample of, a, of an entry. So if you write like this, you know, provide examples, you're explicit, you'll get full points. So but rubrics are a great idea. They're terrific. We have we have a tendency to just kind of embed these throughout the module um, as part of the learning experience. But we found that um, these these few points are just have made a big difference with our students. They're very responsive to to these strategies. And now that's uh, that's one of the biggest complaints from students is they don't always understand what it is they're supposed exactly. to do and what right. it's supposed to be turned on. And I in. think what it should look like. Yes. Because yes. you don't want to give a student full points if they write two sentences versus the student that wrote two paragraphs. And that's just good classroom teaching. Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. So this leads us into course design. Course design is really, really important because the information, it must be clear, it must be recognizable. We've learned that a consistent format, so if you switch it up too much, um, they, it's harder for them to understand what is due, how they're supposed to do it, and then also where to go to get the information or how to complete the information. So course design is real, real important. It helps for it to be sequential. Now you have to figure out for your course what sequential is. Um, for ours, it's simple to complex. So we, we start out with the simple ideas first and then build upon that and go to more complex ideas. You may actually organize your content by unit. Um, what's some other ideas for? Well, I guess module would be a unit. Yep, module for unit purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So look at your course. Look at your content. What makes sense? And you've got to look at this from a student perspective. Anytime you're looking at course design, think about a student that is brand new to your content. They're not familiar with it. How can you best organize it, chunk it? so that they will understand it. Multimedia is always a good idea to include. Um, you do have the UDL, the Universal Design Learning, so keep that in consideration. Um, and based on your students, you can include that where you need. And um, one thing that really helps with course design, if you're not familiar with Quality Matters, they actually have a rubric that will that helps with course design. It's probably one of the best tools out there. I know Sloan C, they also have rubrics that can help with uh, course design. So those are things you can look into. So if course design doesn't come naturally for you, investigate that and really consider looking at what your course looks like and how that content is delivered. The, some other things will call it in matters. They look for clean, non-cluttered. It's easy to navigate and readable. Navigation, that's actually a huge, huge piece with online courses. I've been in courses, I don't know about you, Diane, but I've been in courses where I waste so much time trying to find what right. I need. Right. Um, I know my one bad experience was in Moodle. Now, I don't think it's the Moodle learning management system. It was just the design of the course. And I wasted so much time and got aggravated trying to find, right. just like instructions for assignments. What is it that I need to turn in? I don't, right. you know, so. Please keep that in consideration. And then Diane's done a really cool thing with Get Inspired. So you want to tell the audience a little bit about that? Well, I, I think we're all really trying hard to engage students. And so our course is 15 modules. And so what we've done is at the beginning of every module, and thank goodness for TED Talks. If you haven't heard any, check it out because they're fabulous. But we do it what we call a Get Inspired video at the beginning of every module. And it's linked to the content of that particular module. And it features just phenomenal speakers, scientists, uh, humanitarian, I, I mean just any from any field um, who can inspire students uh, in that area and also give them ideas. And we use that a lot with our students to give them ideas for their free, for their projects where they get to make choices. You know, they could decide on the topic and that sort of thing. So just those little multimedia pieces can be very um, interesting and exciting, and it's 
a nice break from the reading that we expect our students to do so much of. Yes. So we mentioned game-based earlier. The first version of the CTE 230 course was completely in a game-based learning management system. And the learning manage or the game-based learning management system we use is called 3D Game Lab. It comes out of Boise State University. It's a really cool tool. It's a nice tool, but it was not for our audience. Um, our audience enjoyed it, but the content was not structured enough for learning. So that's when we stepped out and put part of it in the canvas in order to make it a little more structured. But the one thing that we found with pulling in the game-based game piece is that there's components in there that actually motivate and excite learners or provide recognition for their hard work. So now we do have those students that could care less and they hate the gaming. <laughs> <Yep>. You know, <laughs> we, we had one that he expressed himself very well that he just did not like the gaming. He didn't like the narrative. He didn't like the avatars. Didn't like the avatars, and that's okay. But for the rest of the class, um, they really got into it. And the one time we held a meetup, they were all comparing their gamer points and wondering how they could get <laughs> their score up higher to compete with, you know, another person in the class. So it is there, and I know I've had a discussion with one of our own faculty members about badges because that's another, you can just use badges by itself and not have to use a whole game-based learning management system. And he's like, you know, we were having this discussion is badges are like stickers. You eventually just throw them in the trash. They don't mean anything. But I remember back in high school I had a teacher that used stickers. Yes, it always ended up in the trash, but I looked forward to getting that sticker on my paper. Mm -hmm. So it was still just a subtle recognition that students can get. Yes, it's not going to mean anything. They're going to throw away, but it, it's still a way to recognize them. Just that little, yay, you did it. So, but there is there is a lot of research on badges. There is a movement to get badges to mean something, like even in the industry world or in the um, business world. So. Keep your eye on that one. There may be something coming out of that that may be valuable to you. And finally, with the game base, we do, I mentioned quest based learning. Quest based is built upon um, like World of Warcraft, where you're on a quest, and that's how information was chunked in our game based learning management system. And with that, we, we have control over we can put in a storyline. So there's a narrative there to kind of make the learning a little bit more interesting or to get the learner themselves excited about moving on to the next quest, you know, the next chunk of content to see what's going to happen next. So you can play around with that. It actually is a good opportunity for scaffolding. It's a nice organized way to scaffold content to move students through the content um, more quickly or at least in an organized manner. manner. Um, you can do measurable outcomes. You can students can easily measure their progress, and you can even get a little friendly competition going. So for any student that likes that gamer point, want to know what their score is compared to others, then they can track. Um, I'm not a big point person. I don't really care what my gamer score is, but I like getting the awards and the badges. So you know, I'm one where those points don't mean anything to me. That's okay. I can ignore that. But I'll I'll get I'll take I'll walk away with other pieces. So and lastly with the game base, um, gaming is kind of like online learning. They're mirroring each other a little bit. When gaming first started, it started out with a behaviorism theory and is currently moving more to a constructivism theory. So there's a little bit of a mirror there. So we may want to pay attention and um, keep up with the gaming research because it looks like it's kind of on a similar path. Yep. So online learning so one may inform the other. I would agree. So next is reflective, and I, I think we've really talked a lot about this. Um, I answered that question um, a little bit earlier on the practices that we have in place. Um, my personal feeling is, and I think all of you will agree, that reflecting upon one's learning is one of the best things you can do. And you know, when you're in the face-to-face -face classroom, it's amazing because you can have these really rich, robust conversations and do that in the classroom as a group. But we don't have that opportunity in an online environment, unfortunately. So as we've mentioned earlier, we've done that in a number of ways. So what's the Critical Friends about? Share, share some well, information Critical about Friends that. is really interesting. It's, it's very simple, actually. It's just peers um, reflecting and commenting on others' work. They build a community. They support one another. The way that we use that is we had students actually go to Poplet, and I think Jeanette mentioned that a little while ago, mm -hmm. 
um, which is a free tool which is amazing. Um, and we'd have them post their projects on there and, and a reflection about how they felt about what they did. And then everyone else in the class would also post theirs and then they would comment on each other's uh, projects. So it's a great reflective tool. It's a great tool for, for helping uh, students improve. And sometimes it's better coming from a peer than the instructor. And I like to use Poplet and put it into a visual format. Oh, it's great. Yes. But again, it's different learning styles. Um, yeah, I think I like that better than the discussion board format. I think they're both effective, but Poplet's more fun. And we've had a great response from our students with Poplet. Matter of fact, a number of them will turn assignments in uh, using Poplet as their, their tool. So, um, you know, again, it's very important, and uh, you know, we do a, we do a number we do reflective practices in a number of ways, as we mentioned earlier. So, so just to refresh your memory, that was our theory of all, just based mm -hmm. on our experience, what we believe works, what we think is important with online learning. Um, I guess this is Creative Commons. They can take and yep. modify, add, and if you do anything wonderful, please share it back with us. We'd love to learn from your experiences too. Okay, Mike. You know, you uh, you guys were just talking about Creative Commons. One of the just questions that came up in the chat window when you were mentioning the motivational videos that you show, you referenced TED Talks. Any uh, any uh, copyright issues yes. there, or maybe you're just using it within fair use provisions, and you're just simply pointing to it. Well, is there any issues there? Um, we we don't have an issue with it. We do both. So we embed the video, but we also provide the link, and we cite it very clearly that it's a TED Talk, and put the link. So with that now. citation, you're okay within the copyright provisions. Yes. Good. Yes. Thanks. I've got another question for you, and I think it's appropriate at this point. One of the participants wonders if you could give us a concrete example of how students might play from different roles. Uh, quotation marks around the play. How students might play from different roles. Got an example in mind? Well, you have, you have to look at your content. I know a common example is um, maybe you're doing a science project. I know we've done some actual, I guess, role playing, mobile playing out on campuses, and it's kind of a, a disaster scene. So we have people coming in as reporters. We have another person coming in as the expert scientist. So the you can kind of play with that if you get into the whole narrative and storyline. Another idea we've had just among our campuses in designing a game for new students to the campus, as you know with community college, we our students look very different all the way across the board. So if we create a game for like an orientation or underprepared students, then maybe they're coming in as a single mom and that's a role they could play. Maybe they're coming in to the average student and has just graduated from high school or maybe they're someone that has been in a career and they're returning. So you have to kind of look um, at your content and who your students are and then de determine that. Do you have any ideas that might be different, Diane? Um, not terribly different. We do a lot of project-based learning. So we will um, you know, either uh, provide a driving question to students and they can work in groups and one can be a researcher and one can you know, be a PR person and that sort of thing. Um, so we've found that that's really uh, successful and we let them self-assign those roles. Um, they can also, um, we've had them work with, with experts from industry and from the colleges too as part of quote unquote teams and role playing where they actually bring in a real expert which I think is a, is a great experience. Uh, for them. Well, good. Those are good yeah. suggestions. A uh, very quick one, and last question before we move on. Um, you mentioned Canvas. Are, are there any game options, gaming options in Canvas that you know of? I don't know of any. I'm not aware of any third party plugins. However, you can, I, I, I can't even say easily. You can't easily turn, the, turn it into a game environment, but there's, if you do Canvas, I think a search on Canvas yeah, and gaming. Yeah. Um, there's a guy from I want to say university. He actually using a Google spreadsheet. He was actually able to turn the whole Canvas environment into a quest-based learning environment, and then they they kept track of gold. So that's what the Google spreadsheet was for. It kept the count of the gold, and he would give the students a certain amount of gold and they could earn gold through activities. And then also they spent the gold as they moved throughout the course. So 
I know there's options out there. And then we also played with Canvas. Was that did you play with me on that, Diane, or was that someone else? No. Okay. So we went in and tried to manipulate Canvas using the compensate feature. And we were able to build it, but it was just ugly. It, it, it worked, but it was ugly. Yeah, okay. so, yeah you'll, you'll have to play there. And, okay, and yeah, we'll, we'll get our Google tools and, and go researching. I would like to get. I'd like to get some gold. There you go. Uh, anyhow, uh, look, we're, we're so perfect on time. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes up for your next section where you're going to challenge uh, us uh, to take some action. So go ahead. So I first want to tell you that, that uh, you're getting off easy. <laughs> I wanted to give you more, but Jeanette had this, this in mind, so I'll let her take this away. Okay, so you're probably familiar, or some of you may be familiar with a 30 Gold Challenge. I know that's popular out on the internet. Uh, just 30 Gold Challenges to lose weight, or to um, um, I know there's one with instructional technology to learn like 30 different tools, stuff like that. So yeah, we took it easy on you, and we're just giving you an eight challenge for eight Gold Challenge for the summer to prepare for fall semester. So that's what we're going to show you. And by the way, the images on the screen, those avatar pictures that we use in our game-based learning environment um, to, with students. So those are our instructor yeah. profiles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so another drum roll. Okay, so never, and you know, we also were going to reference Ladderman, but it's, we have eight, just it didn't work. It wasn't the same. So number eight, provide an opportunity for students to reflect on an experiential learning activity or other assignment. Excellent. Okay. Number seven, evaluate course content for opportunities to chunk your content and add some multimedia to make your um, content more engaging for students and to enhance their learning. And number six, try to integrate several quality matter components. So try to provide activities that support active learning. Like Jeanette suggested earlier, really look at your course. Make sure your navigation is consistent, clean, readable, uh, pleasing, and minimize distractions. So I, I think I said earlier you want to stick to around five to nine chunks of information per page. So if I know I have a tendency to want to put in three million things because they're exciting and fun and informational, but I have to really check myself and kind of step back and make sure I'm in that five to nine range. Excellent. And by the way, this information will be included in the handout, so you don't have to try to scribble it all down. You will get the information after the webinar. All right, number five, provide at least one opportunity in your course, in your online course, for students to fail, fail again, and then be able to be successful without being penalized. So. I know you can't always do this for every activity or every um, chunk of content, but at least try it once where students, they're, they're able to fail and be successful. They can learn from their failure. Number four, one of my favorites, of course, is participate, and I hopefully you can do this daily, in your course community by posting questions, answering posts. Um, like Jeanette mentioned, set up a fake student to kind of prompt and inspire students to communicate. Um, it's very, very important. Number three, increase interactions with students in the course by creating some type of a weekly communication. Um, you can take Diane's idea with the coffee break, my idea with the general, general reminder email. Or um, the other thing that's really successful too is having virtual office hours. And I know we participated um, in the eCar survey this recent year, and that was a huge request by students is for faculty to start using instant messaging tools, um, some of those other um, live interaction tools for office hours. So consider exploring that. And number two, try to provide your students with opportunities to build upon their personal interests and knowledge. It really does help make the work more meaningful. Um, and try to do that in at least one unit or module if, if possible. I know you're all teaching different subjects, but I, I think you'll find it a really rewarding experience. And number one of our eight challenge for you, beat your institution's response and feedback policy if you have one by inter interacting with your students sooner than required. Um, 
If you do not, if your institution does not have a policy, we would highly challenge you to respond within 12 hours because realistically, in this day and age, 24 to 48 hours in the online world is forever from a student perspective. So it is, and especially for us when we were having students work in, in 3D game lab, is that many of these assignments required our approval before they could progress through uh, the sequence. So if we didn't get back to them for two days, they couldn't do any more work. Yeah. So like some momentum. Yep. <laughs> yep. <coughs> All right. So we just like to re review the objectives. Um, we set out to provide an overview of um, different learning theories, and I hope we accomplished that for you. Uh, there are many more more out there, but we kind of took what applied to our experience and what's working. So you can. Um, Oh, by the way, with online learning theories too, that's kind of a wide open field for research. So you are free to come up with your own and get published and share it with everyone. Um, it's an emerging field and changing constantly. So um, the second one was address online learning principles for deeper learning and um, student engagement. So I think we covered that. I think we covered that. Okay, Diane, let's take last two and provide examples of instruction. Provided uh, examples of instructional. Uh, I can't talk. <laughs> forgive me. Um, provide examples of instructional strategies, and I think we did a lot of that. That was really one of our main goals with this webinar is to really talk about what we've tried, what worked, and what didn't work. And I think we did uh, succeed in that area. And then, of course, as you know, you have eight challenges to work on after you leave us today. <laughs> well, you know, thank you both, uh, Diane and Jeanette. We've got. Some very interesting questions. I'd like to stay on the line for a few minutes and, and address some of those. So folks, you can drop them right into the uh, chat box. One of the most current questions that is, in, at least in time, related to what you were just talking about, and the question is, is there a more accessible, and that means easy for students technology-wise, uh, means of doing virtual office hours? You know, I have to admit, I've been using myself go to meeting lately. They've improved it. It's been very easy to use. Do you use stuff like that or any, any ways of, uh, of making students easier to do these virtual office hours? Um, we've had some success with Google Hangout. That's um, one of our preferences. With that, you actually have the video and you can have more than one person in with no problem. I know another popular tool is just Skype, um, just regular Skype. Mm -hmm. I know professionally we use Google Talk. That's the one that we use among um, ourselves, but not so much with students. No. I don't really know why, right? But, but I think for it, well, I'm just going to say I, I just want to give an opinion. The reason I like the go to, go to meeting thing is it's a very seamless. Uh, interface so that they can participate by phone or by voice over IP, whatever way works. I like that aspect of it. I just wanted to throw that in. Hey, Mike, can I just uh, interject something very quickly? Sure. In my experience, um, you're right, GoToMeeting, Microsoft Live Meeting, uh, WebEx also entered those in the text box. But the other thing I wanted to mention is most of these services have a 30-day free trial. So you don't have to invest any money out of the gate. You can kind of sample all of them. So I hope that's helpful. That's a good point, Tracy. Thanks. Yeah, and then a lot of the learning management systems are starting to have those tools available too. So that's mm -hmm. another area to, to look at. You know, let's pause a moment in our questions. Um, I want to continue the questioning. <laughs> well, continue your questioning. That sounds funny. And uh, But while we're doing that, I'm going to ask the participants if they will help us. That is. We're going to launch an online survey right now. It's only going to be up for 90 seconds. And we're going to ask you to help us pay our bills. And what I mean by that is we're funded in part by the National, from the National Science Foundation. And it helps us uh, to, to demonstrate impact of this webinar series to our funders. So please take a minute. There's two questions with your check boxes and the third one that's optional where you can put in uh, questions. So while they're doing that, uh, Jeanette and, and uh, Diane, let me ask you this question. Are all of these theories apical, do you think, in today's MOOC world, the massive open online courses? Anything that you see that would change, or do all of these apply? That's well, a hard question. Uh, the, the one that we didn't even cover, MOOC originally started with connected learning. That was their origination. 
Um, most MOOCs today, however, do not use that model. Mm -mm. We are getting ready to launch a MOOC come this fall. I guess fall, October. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have a little bit more experience and knowledge after that. But I don't know. I I, I see different theories being used, but I don't really know what's working. I think there'll be some changes in the sense of you know here we really stressed that the interaction with students, personal interaction. But if you have 500 or 1,000 students in your MOOC course, that's going to be very difficult to do. So I think that there are going to be some dramatic changes in some areas. Um, you also want to look at, we've been, Jeanette and I have been researching this out quite a bit lately, you also want to look at having a MOOC course be more autonomous because, I mean, if we've got a class with 30 students, that's time consuming, but 500 or 1,000 obviously would be overwhelming. So I think there's going to have to be a lot of modification mm -hmm. on how material is presented and shared. We should do a webinar yeah, on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We could um, with the connected learning too. If you use that theory for a MOOC, um, I've talked to instructors that have taught courses like that, and it's just overwhelming the work, just the correspondence because it's all about connected learning and really building those connections with students and with the instructor. So um, I think was it Elisa Cooper said online learning is a way of life. Yes, she did. So the MOOC would definitely be a way of life. No, that would take over your life. Yeah, yeah that would take over your life. You're right. <laughs> well, you know, I recognize I recognize some of our colleagues online, and I know they've been doing MOOCs. It'll be interesting to hear their. Uh, I don't mean right now, but to talk with them about how it's <laughs> yeah. gone and and, and yeah. whether it took their life over, as you mentioned. Yes, yeah, I have another question for you. For the MOOC webinar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what, folks? <laughs> that's enough for this uh, this this uh, survey up there. So I'm going to count down. Please make your last choices on the survey. Uh, Tracy, let's close that in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, let me do a couple of things, Jeanette and and Diane, and then we'll close up here. I just got to get through my last bunch of slides. You know, whether you're joining us live or watching a recorded version of this webinar, uh, you might want to, this is mostly for the people who are doing the recording, you can go ahead and do that. Now, the webinar resources that you'll see today from, we've mentioned it several times, uh, you'll get an email on Monday that gives you all this stuff. But you can find uh, the access to the recording slides and the handout from this webinar and lots of other ones at maytechnetworks.org. And for this particular one, you would search under this title, right, Online Learning Strategies. Mm -hmm. Now, I, there's a couple of upcoming webinars. We're getting ready for our 2013-2014 webinar season. It's going to be announced in about six weeks. And you can see any archives of our entire past season uh, online. If you attended a live version of this webinar, and we'd like a certi certificate, excuse me, certificate of participation, you can email Shannon. But when you do that, make sure that you give the name that you logged in by, because she'll be able to trace the logs uh, that you see today and then allow her to do a certificate. Or if you happen to be in a room, sometimes 10 people in a room together do this, and you want a certificate, make sure you indicate the name of the person that your room logged in. That'll help us a little bit. Now, in addition to that, if there's one conference you should go to this year, it's coming up fast in Austin, Texas, July 21 through 24, the High Impact Technology Exchange Conference. You can see the, uh, the website right up there, highimpacttech.org. So while we got the thank you slide here, let's go through a couple of these questions. Jeanette and, and uh, Diane, we're perfectly on time. Let me go back through the question log and bring up a couple of ones. Um, there was one, do you ever use these tools? Do you know what PB works or Wikispaces? Do you use those as other ways of posting your materials for your students? Do you ever do that? You might not for be familiar CTE. with that one. Okay, for CTE 230, we uh, have a wiki site, but we don't post assignments on that page. We don't use that for student use. That's more um, just general information. And Jeanette? We used to use it as an orientation. So the oh, way that's right. Because um, the first version when it was strictly in the game-based learning environment, we actually used the wiki space as the orientation because that was a structure that's that right. they recognized and familiar with. So we yeah. have used it that way. 
And in the past, I, I can't say, no, I really haven't used the wikis. It's normally a learning management system of some sort. And then I know with the North Tier Group Consortium, those courses actually send out a week's weekly summary of the discussion board. So as they have discussions throughout the week and throughout ideas, actually summarize that all up into a Word document and a table and then share that out weekly. So that's another way to communicate and summarize the content that's being yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. It takes a little bit of time to do that, but well worth it. Yeah. People appreciate it. Good. Here's another uh, question. Take a look at your chat window. Look at the time mark at about 11.08 a.m. and that's at least on my time. It's a question, you see there it says, what about connectivism? And they mentioned Downs and Siemens as references. Do you see that as an extension of constructivism? And the gentleman says he sees some overlaps with your all theory. What do you think? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, we had debated whether to include that as a theory in and talk about that. But we, it's like we provide the opportunity for people to connect to one another. And we even have them connect to outside resources. So there's an activity where they have to contact an expert in their community or in their content area. So we do do that. However, it's not a main focus of our work. It's like we encourage it. We even have an activity that encourages it or requires it. But um, we just haven't done a lot of it. And we feel, you know, we came to, to jokingly, um, when we came up with a theory of all, it was because there is so much overlapping of all of these theories out there that it's really hard. I don't think you can pigeonhole one. I mean, you have to kind of look at all of them together. And so that's why we did the theory of all, because of all the overlapping. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, a couple of specific questions about Canvas. You mentioned it. Um, is Canvas enabled for mobile devices? Yes, it is. I, I have not yeah. played with the mobile app yet, so I'm not sure how, um, how robust there. it is. Yeah. We haven't had a need for it with our environment, but it is available. It's out there. And the instructor is having their uh, conference next week, so <laughs> maybe some people are going. I know we have people from Maricopa going, so maybe they can bring back some information. Interesting. Good. Okay, so there's a, a whole slew of things in the in the chat window. Let me just, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep going for another, let's call it another four minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, sure. Remember back to that fake student idea that you had? <laughs> yeah. That you yeah. talked about? Um, interesting question in the chat. What about any ethics associated with that? Do you, in fact, uh, inform the students that you're, you're doing a fake student uh, approach? Um. In our case, no, we did not. But you know, you have to look at how yes. you're using that character. Right. So you you may you may have yes. to. So we did not, but they played a subtle role. I think you're right. It depends on how you use it. Yes, right. Yes. And we were comfortable with using it in that capacity just to stimulate discussion. Right. So you know, one of the uh, you see several of the participants mentioning that they have had experience in online courses where the instructor has done it and probably where they haven't. So right. it's interesting, uh, people in the chat window thought it was an interesting approach and, and of course this is a good thing uh, to wonder about. Great question. Now let me look at one other question here. Let me scan back up. Boy, there's so, many, there's so much going on in the chat window today uh, that I think it's really good. Okay, so, so hold on a second, coming up to this. Uh, we talked about gaming and Canvas. We talked about copyrights. Very good. All right, good. Um, let me do this as the final question. You know, we always struggle with thinking about, let's call it humanity, that interaction with students that you've talked so much about it today. If I had to say, tell me the theory that best op optimizes the humanity, because that's what I'm interested in. Is there one of those single theories? Is, is it a mixture? How do I optimize my humanity? That sounds funny, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a mixture. And the one thing, we didn't mention it, but there's um, kind of a movement or an idea out there to do 
it's service learning online where you're doing an online course, but you're encouraging students to actually do an experiential activity, which is service learning in their own community or their their own environment. So that's a concept that's being played around with because when you have an online student, they're not on the campus, so you're not going to, you're not going to go do a service learning project as a class together. But that doesn't mean that you still can't provide that opportunity and make it an assignment where students work in their own local community. Um, we also have the constructivism that kind of plays with that a little bit, where it's playing to the student's interest, so they can actually take that and you know explore an area of interest to them. So those are different ways. It, it, yeah, I, I think it's a blend of things. Yeah, it really it, is. It's a blend. And once it's, once again, it comes down to course content and what's appropriate, what's doable, as far as the, and what the instructor is comfortable with. Lovely. Well, that was a good response. Uh, Diane and Jeanette, that brings us to the end of our of our time today. You know what really struck me, and I knew this of course, but how much effort really goes into doing a quality online course? I mean, I know sometimes administrators think, oh, this is a money maker because faculty can do more with, you know, more for the same amount of money that we pay them. Uh, but anyhow, I didn't make get political about that. But it's uh, but it certainly does take a lot of time to really do this in a quality way, and, and that really impressed me today, the, the approaches that you've taken to, to bring quality to online courses. I wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, so participants, and if you'd like to use, right up there in the upper left button, there's a little applause. It's right next to where you were clicking on, on uh, the polling today. So let's click on that applause button. Oh, listen to that thunderous applause. Several people commented they really liked your drum roll uh, during the webinar today. They hadn't heard <laughs> one on a webinar before, so that was fun. So uh, thank you both very much. Everyone, that officially concludes our webinar. And Jeanette and Diane, if you'll just stay on uh, the line for just a moment, we're going to officially close the webinar. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Go ahead, and Tracy, and shut it down. Okay, thank you.